was moved up two days to Thursday, October 28, 1965. Anticipation in St. Louis was running high. For two and a half years, people had watched this thing being built, you know, piece by piece and gradually rising above the horizon. Soon you have this beautiful, gigantic thing, you know, but everybody's question was, is it going to meet? There were even cartoons that existed at the time that showed that the two legs missed one another and they were kind of still building and going past, you know. So they showed it in uh, schools on television, closed circuit TV and all kinds of things. And there were a lot of people who took off work and were down waiting for this, this big moment of joining of the two legs. On a bright sunny day, as 10,000 people watched anxiously from the ground, the final piece was to be put in place. However, the sun on the south leg of the arch was causing it to expand. The leg itself would start to warp, if you will, and so it would warp out of position. And once that happened, especially by the time you got up 630 feet into the air, there was no way you were going to be able to sort of skew it back into the right position. So what they did is they actually uh, got the fire department, St. Louis Fire Department, to come out with their hoses and uh, wash the, the leg with cold water up to uh, quite a height, I'd say 200, 250 feet. And it, the arch looked like Niagara Falls, really, with all the water coming down there. The cold water tempered the expansion on the south leg, but the intense sun still caused the legs to lean to within two and a half feet of each other. The keystone was eight and a half feet long. Fortunately, engineers had anticipated the problem and had hydraulic jacks that could apply a million pounds of thrust to widen the gap. That would allow the last section to be inserted. Ironically, the man performing that task, unlike the throng witnessing this event, would not actually see the keystone going into place. I was probably, probably was the only person in the whole country, or I don't know if we can say the world or not, but I was probably the only one that had never seen it go into place because uh, the operator of the derricks were uh, in a shack 100 foot behind the leg of the arch. He had to listen to very specific commands that were given to him over uh, like a walkie-talkie or telephone type of thing, intercom, uh, which, you know, two inches to the right, two inches to the left type of thing to put the piece in place. Vito was my phone operator, or really my eyes in the sky, so to speak. He was the man that directed the, the crane as to get up a little bit higher or swing right or swing left or to boom up or down, whatever was needed. As the crowd cheered, the final piece slipped evenly into place. The jack pressure was released. The natural thrust of the legs clamped the section into place and it was welded together. It was such an important date in St. Louis history is probably because people have been waiting so long for this thing to happen. Uh, at no time during the, the construction of the arch did we ever, anyone that was closely associated with the project, did we ever feel that this thing would not meet at the top? They built it up e on each side symmetrically so that both halves of the arch went up at the same time. Incredible level of precision in the, in the construction. It is amazing. Now that the outside of the arch was completed, Engineers turned to the next big project, installing a tram system that would take hundreds of thousands of visitors a year to the top of the curved arch and back. But how to design this unique system would stymie the top elevator experts in the world. The magnificent exterior of the St. Louis Arch was now complete. The next major task was building the unique tram system, one that would transport visitors up the tallest memorial in the Arch architect Aero Saarinen approached the top elevator experts in the world but none of them could come up with a solution. Well, the, the unique uh, challenges in uh, developing this system, of course, were it's the level of precision which had to be followed in order to make it work, going up to 630 feet in a diminishing uh, triangular space. Then, 
an accidental meeting turned to good fortune. It was just pure luck that a guy named Dick Bowser walked into the offices of Montgomery Elevator Company one day, just happenstance, came by to see a friend, and the friend had been talking with the Saarinen people and, you know, started a, the light bulb went off in his head, and he said, you know, this guy, this guy's really inventive. He might be able to be the one that could solve the problem for them. Dick Bowser was a college dropout. He and his father had developed and installed Bowser parking system elevator equipment. The elevators traveled horizontally and vertically, as well as diagonally. Saarinen was familiar with the system and immediately hired Bowser in June of 1960. While Saarinen wholeheartedly endorsed Bowser, city officials questioned his background. Hoping to hire someone with more experience, they gave him an impossible deadline deliver a proposal in two weeks. Well, to tell you the truth, uh, my reaction was, how much are they going to pay me for that two weeks? The National Park Service, as the agency overseeing the arch, required two things. A passenger volume of 3,500 people in an eight-hour day, and a conveyance system that would not distort the exterior of the arch. Bowser first considered a standard elevator but putting a square box in a curved arch was not practical. Bowser also thought about the escalator. An escalator running at an angle in that curved arch, it just, it just got too, too involved. And you'd had to change escalators every 20 or 30 feet up there. He then considered the Ferris wheel as a possible model. The problem was the distance up one leg and down the other and back was over half a mile too unrealistic at that time for any chain or cable to travel. It had to go on slowly, and it would never stop. It just had to keep going. He started to get the idea that he had to have two independent systems, one for each leg. Bowser finally came up with a solution combining the principle of the Ferris wheel with that of the elevator. I thought about the barrels for people to ride inside of it, and then it was independently powered. Each one had a hoist machine and counterweights and everything. And it only took half of the arch sections. The tram elements, the tracks and everything, were put into place while the arch was being built. But then uh, the cars had to be fabricated. The idea for the car capsules came from a magazine ad. And it was a new automobile at that time, a compact automobile called the Ford Falcon and they actually had a little inset of how the seats were arranged in there. And he took that and actually used that as a kind of a model to show how a small space could accommodate several people, up to five. 